absolutely no control over that video. I have shamelessly borrowed it and with permission from Vivid Virtual Reality. And if you want to have a look at the work of this very talented company, they're actually doing videos, uh, reconstructions of a lot of the castles in Wales. And they've done three of Owen Glyndwr's house, which gives you a far better idea than the archaeological remains of um, Owen Glyndwr's houses, which have never been properly excavated, actually. Uh, so as a plug for Vivid Virtual Reality, I've made a point of always mentioning them. And we're hoping later on to um, use the video in some other capacity, but I'll come around to that later on. Should we go on to the slideshow? Yeah. Uh, this is the result of a conversation I had with a filmmaker. Um, I'd written a script for him, which he filmed, and the film is a crime, modern crime, and it's up on Amazon. And about two or three months after we finished making it, he gave me a ring and said, how do you feel about writing a script for Glyndur? And I knew that he was really passionate about wanting to make a film of Glyndur's life. But I also had the feeling that if I wrote the script, I would never ever get paid for it because that seems to be the lot of most script writers. You're very lucky if one in 20 of the scripts that you write actually make it to the screen. But uh, after a couple of meetings with him, I decided that what I do is write a book with a view to possibly filming it at the end of it, if we could raise the funds to make the film. And this is the closest we've got to it so far. We employed actors for four days. We took over a film studio and we filmed the jackets of the book and we filmed a short trailer for it. And these stills are from it. This is Julian Lewis Jones, who I think you'll agree is the absolute perfect Owen Glyndur. Um, this is Vincent de Paul, an American accent, actor who took elocution lessons to perfect an English royal accent. And I've got a few more of these stills taken from the film afterwards. If you could go on to the next one. Owen Glyndwr uh, crowned himself Prince of Wales, but he had an impeccable history to the royal houses of Wales. His father was a Prince of Paris. His mother was a princess of de Hilbath in the south. And they also had links to Llewellyn, Llewellyn the Last and Llewellyn the Great. Both were dead, neither left any heirs. But uh, Owen Glyndwr's wife actually claimed, whether this is true or not, but she claimed that she is descended from an illegitimate daughter of Llewellyn the Last, who was hidden after he was murdered. The other map here i absolutely love this is a map of all the rivers in wales and if ever we needed proof that it rains in wales this is it <laughs> <laughs> but it is beautiful uh owen was the most unlikely prince of wales or the most unlikely man to rebel he'd spent his whole life working for the english king first of all in the royal courts. He'd actually fought for the King in the Channel Wars, in the Scottish Wars, in the Irish Wars. He was actually Henry IV's squire at one point, along with several of his friends, including Hotspur. But in 1402, uh, Henry IV introduced the Welsh penal laws, and these were absolutely devastating. Um, basically, they took away all the Welsh rights. Englishmen um, were to try all the legal cases in Wales. Probably the worst thing he did was prevent bards and minstrels from plying their trade. He called them wasters, spendthrifts. But the trouble is, the bards were the keepers of Welsh history. And that's how people found out about their history, through the bardic songs, through their stories. And 
once they were prevented from going from court to court and entertaining people, it wasn't just a question of entertainers disappearing. It was the whole of the Welsh cultural history, music, poetry, everything. Uh, the other thing he did was he forbade uh, any food to be taken into Wales, any armour, any swords. No Welshman was allowed to defend his wife, if he or his family, against any assault by the English. So it was really totally devastating. So it's little wonder that people were looking to Owen Glinder to do something about it. And the final straw for him came when Reginald de Grey, his marcher lord neighbour, who was English and loyal to the English king, suddenly started taking bits of his land. Go on to the next slide, please. And this is Reginald de Grey's castle in Ruffin, and this is Reginald de Grey's um, battle banner, if you like. It would have been the insignia worn by all his knights. And the next one. This is the remains of Sitcharth, uh, which you saw in the video earlier. Um, if you're going to go and look for Owen Glyndor's houses, uh, take an ordnance survey map with you. If it hadn't been for a Frenchman, I don't think we would have ever found it. Uh, the only signs on uh, these historical monuments are the ones you get when you're on top of them. They're nothing beforehand at all. This, even in the village of Sitchath, we started asking where Owen Glyndor's house was. Nobody knew. But you can see from these aerial photographs that it really covered a huge area. There's uh, definite outlines of other buildings underneath. This would have been his great hall. He actually had two great halls on it. And one of the reasons we know so much about Owen Glyndor's house is uh, the poet Yolo Gok wrote a very detailed poem about the livestock that was there and the doves and the birds and how he always had open door and full flagons of wine for any poets who chose to come and seek his hospitality. Next one, please. Yeah, as I said, these have never been really excavated. They only excavated a short section of the moat. If we go on to the next one, and then that's just another one um, of the overall site. A beam was found in the moat and uh, it was cut short and taken to Clansillan Community Centre and it's very proudly there. The end of it, I believe, is in Cardiff Museum. If you go on to the next one, you can actually see the, um, the really pretty large and pretty solid. <laughs> and the next one, please. And these are the signs, as I said, with Sitchath, it's actually by the gate as you go in, and it's also on private land, so you can't just really go in and have a wander. And the one for Glyndefford is even worse. Um, we were practically on top of it before we realised what it was, and we were looking at the back of the, the sign. It wasn't very helpful. The house at Glyndefordbury was unusual in that it was stone because Henry IV had actually forbid any Welshman for living within the walls of a town or within a stone walled house. This is actually Clan if I'm getting caught up on this, uh, Intry Harris Manor. It was built the same time as Owen Glyndor's uh, hunting lodge. It's well worth a visit, but all the displays in it are connected to the English Civil War, which is a couple of hundred years later. Uh, next slide. This again is a stone built house of the same era, but this one is actually in Somerset and it's called Blackmore Farm. And we went there to stay because I wanted to see what a chapel that hadn't been touched from a medieval house would have looked like. And they've actually preserved it. And I recommend it heartily if you want to go and find out what a medieval house was like. They've preserved it beautifully. And the next one, please. And that is authentic um, items from the 14th century. And the next one. 
and this is all that's left of Glyndefordwy or the stone house on the River Dee today. Uh, I wish somebody would excavate it. One of the mysteries about Owen Glyndor, and there's an awful lot of them, is where are the crown jewels that were last seen at his coronation? The crown jewels were stolen or taken or retrieved by Edward I, and he deposited them, them in the Palace of Westminster, and then uh, left them there, went off campaigning, and somebody came in, it, I believe it was a monk, and uh, a few other people, they went in and they stole them. Now, Edward I announced that all the English crown jewels had been retrieved, but the Welsh crown jewels, there is no mention of them at all. If you look at this, this is Llewellyn uh, with the Welsh crown that was just disappeared at this time. And this sketch here is of the Cross of Neath, which was given to Howell Dar by the Pope in 1054. And it was supposed to contain, along with rubies and uh, emeralds and other precious stone, a sliver of the true cross. This is Henry IV and this is Henry V. And this is Henry III. And down below here, you've got, uh, that's the King of Scotland, Alexander, and that is the Prince of Wales proving to everyone who saw this particular tapestry that there was no doubt that the English king was in charge of the whole of Britain. And the next one, please. And these are the Royal Arms of Wales. Again, they're supposed to have existed in gold, but where they are now, perhaps they're buried with Owen Glyndor, uh, gives somebody an um, excuse to go and look for the body. Henry IV, I don't know why he wanted to dress like a Turk, but uh, that is the painting that most people connect with Henry IV. And one of the other things about Owen Glyndor is the number of other figures at the time he was connected with, and one of these is Henry Hotspur. There's no doubt about it that they were great friends before he declared his War of Independence. And it's a friendship that endured. Henry IV was forever accusing Owen Glyndor and Henry and Mortimer of plotting behind his back, with some good reason, actually, um, way everything transpired. And without a doubt, Owen Glyndor and Henry Hotspur were making plans, even while Henry was supposedly fighting for the king. The next one, please. This is the tripartite venture. Henry the Hotspur, unfortunately, was killed at the Battle of Shrewsbury, but his father, the Earl of Northumberland, met with Owen Glyndor and Edmund Mortimer, more about Edmund Mortimer later on. And between them, they decided to carve up Britain. Uh, this was going to be Glyndor. I don't know if he would have changed the name of Wales, but it says a lot for Owen Glyndor, that he also wanted um, an inn into the wool trade in Stoke. So obviously he intended to tax that, and that would have proved very, very lucrative for Wales. Edmund Mortimer was going to rule the south of the country, and Percy was going to have the north. This is Onwick Castle, where Percy lived. Owen Glyndor's battle flag and Mortimer's. If you go on to the next one, please. And this is the battle flag of Llewellyn. So you can see that Owen Glyndor was laying claim to the royal family of Wales. Um, and this is supposedly the drag hour, the golden dragon that Arthur Pendragon, the father of Arthur, fought under. After so many years, it's impossible to prove or disprove that sort of thing, but they make for really wonderful stories. And the next one, another one of the wonderful characters that I really enjoyed writing about was Llewellyn ap Gruffydd Vachan of Llandovery. He really was quite a, a character. He drank more wine than anybody else in Wales, more than most people in England, actually. Um, Henry the Fourth 
uh, asked him to betray Owen Glyndwr. So Llewellyn ab Gruffydd offered to take Henry IV up to Snowdon and look for Owen Glyndwr. And after about three or four weeks of going up and down Snowdonia, Henry IV realised that Llewellyn ab Gruffydd had absolutely no intention whatsoever of betraying Owen Glyndwr. So he marched him back to Llandavri and there he hung Drew and quartered him, which uh, was a bit extreme, but um, Llewellyn actually said on the scaffold that he would not betray his friend. And this is Llewellyn at Grafferdwachen's battle banner. And you can see that because the lions are sort of lying down, he had no military intentions, as opposed to Owen Glyndwr's shield where the lions are rampant. The next one, please. Uh, I really, really love this statue. It's in Llandavri on the spot where Llewellyn ab Gruffydwchen was hung, drawn and quartered. Behind it is the remains of Llandavri Castle. It's one of those fabulous statues that is hollow inside, so you can put in your own hero if you like. It's also very like the one they've got in Cornwall of King Arthur. And the next one. These are etchings of what it was like to be hung drawn and quartered this one is supposed to be william wallace it's probably a victorian uh, idea of what it was like and the next one please uh, this is a medieval one the whole point of hanging drawing and quartering someone was to humiliate them as much as possible before death it really was a uh, truly awful fate for anyone and it was devised by Edward I for uh, the very first person to be hung, drawn and quartered was Llewellyn the Great's brother David. The next one please. Head again, uh, one of the great things about researching Owen Glyndwr is I found out an awful lot about Wales and I managed to wander around great big chunks of it. Head again, I had very definite ideas on what I was going to look for. I found nothing there. This is um, a monument to Owen Glyndwr's first great battle, where he's supposed to have fought 1500 Fleming, uh, Fleming warriors and uh, caused massive casualties among them, while only um, 20 of his men were wounded. Hopefully one day we can come up with a better monument than this. If you go on to the next one, perhaps you'll see just how difficult it is to try and draw conclusions from the uh, accounts of the day as to where exactly Owen Glyndwr's camp was. It's a desolate land up there, it really is. I certainly wouldn't have chosen, and I doubt Owen Glyndwr chose to hide out there. It really is sort of open um very damp very windy next one please uh owen glyndor also had fun with a lot of the ab abbeys in wales they were either for him or they were against him and this is all that remained of cumia abbey after he burnt it down uh we went and had a, a look at it and we parked in a farmyard wondering if we were allowed to do that and i ended up talking to the farmer and uh, we talked a little bit about Welsh history and he really didn't have much interest in it. Next one, please. Uh, but here is the grave of Llewellyn. And after he was killed by the, by the English soldiers who weren't really sure who he was until after they cut his head off, his head was taken to London and bits of his, I quote, mangled body were buried in come here abbey the monks later fell out with owen glyndor and owen actually burnt the abbey to the ground after looting it go to the next one and this is something that really was an absolute gem it's a medieval doorway to the church and the farmer was telling me that uh, whoever uh, looked after the farm near come here abbey roundabouts um 
1870, 1870. When they were rebuilding the church, as so many Victorian churches were rebuilt at that time, the farmer rather liked the doorway, so he took it and he had it put in his garden wall. You can't see it from the road and you can't even see it as you walk past his garden. But uh, after we were talking a bit about Glindo, he said perhaps he'd like to come and have a look at it. He also told me that Cadu were after it and he said they're not going to get it because I'm very happy with it in my garden wall. So I hope he can keep it. And the next one. Owen Glyndwr's seal, which was on his penal letter, which is written to the King of France. It's the only real image we've got of him. And uh, there have been several pleas with France to send the penal letter back. We've got a copy of it in Cardiff Museum. And the next one, please. And that is a, an illustration from the medallion or the, the seal. Next one, and that's a Wigglydua signature. He was fluent in Greek, Italian, Welsh, French, and English. Possibly Scottish Gaelic and certainly Irish Gaelic. Next one, and the next one. Um, this is a sketch that I think comes from the turn of the last century. And this is a statue of Owen Glyndwr that somebody in Led Zeppelin pay, paid for. And the next one, please. Uh, this um, is quite a, a really nice one, I think, of him. And somebody is making them and selling them on Etsy, if anybody's interested. And the next one. S4C did a programme uh, a few years back of looking for Owen Glyndwr to see if they could find out what he looked like. Um, there's a lot of stories about the wart under his eye. It wasn't under his eye, it was above his eye, but apart from getting that wrong. Uh, what we tend to forget about these medieval knights, they were huge, absolutely enormous. I mean, Henry VIII was six and a half feet, Owen Glyndwr was six and a half feet, Hotspur was six and a half feet. Part of their training was somersaulting backwards off horses in full armour. So these were extremely fit, very large men who were in every possible way were bred for war. And because they were nobles and were fed the best food, they did grow quite enormously big, some of them. And this is Julian Lewis Jones, who was brought in on the programme. And I think it gave the director I was working with the idea of asking Julian to pose for the covers of my books. And the next one. Yeah, this was 14th century height of fashion with curled up toes that apparently in Henry IV's court, they used to tie string to it and then tie it to their knees to keep the points up. Next one. I like to think Owen Glyndwr wore sensible shoes like this. And it's things like that that enable um, not just me, but any writer to get into the head of the character they portray. And the next one. Uh, this is Tally Abbey, and there are documents connecting Owen Gildu with most of the abbeys in Wales. And the next one, please. Uh, this is Valley Crucis, which was founded by the great grandfather of Owen Gildu's great grandfather. It's got a magnificent selection of tombstones. If you go on to the next one, please. Um, dating back, some of them are really odd, really eerie. If you keep going, please. Um, and this is Owen Glyndwr's great grandfather's great grandfather's tombstone, which is absolutely magnificent. A lot of these have been altered over the years, and some of them have been turned into um, fireplaces and mantel shelves. Next one, please. And these are some of the medieval tiles that are in uh, Strata Florida Abbey. And it was incredible looking at those, but knowing that Owen Glyndwr possibly walked across them. This is the site of Bring Glass, which is another one of Owen Glyndwr's great victories. It's the one where Edmund Mortimer led the king's forces against Glyndwr's forces. And Ed 
Edmund Mortimer was actually captured by Owen Glyndwr at the Battle of Green Glass. Um, what the Welsh did basically was they were at the top of the hill and they were encouraging the English to follow them up and the English did. And then when the English soldiers were halfway up the hill, the archers in front turned round and shot their fellows. They were Welsh archers who had volunteered for the English army. So uh, no, the Welsh didn't always fight fair, but the winning was more important in some cases. Um, I've also got a few pictures here of what the churches were like in Glyndwr's time, because the introduction to Bible stories came from the paintings on the wall. And the nearest I can think of is Russia, where you have illustrations. What you must remember is in medieval times, very few people could read and write apart from their mobility. So their whole exposure to the biblical stories was through the paintings on the wall of the churches. The next one, you can flick through these at St. Sebastian. Um, it's quite moving if you actually go into a church that's decorated like that. And I really am not happy with the Victorians for altering it so much. This is Hamblethen Church in um, the early 1900s. They were doing something with one of the crypts and they broke through and found a room which had about somewhere between 200 and 300 skeletons and they think they were the English who were wounded at the Battle of Bringlass. Beautifully carved screens. Religion was um, unbelievably important to these people. Owen Linda actually lived by biblical edicts, very religious, very pious. And the next one. And that is a typical medieval church, very simple. This is a church uh, in Snowdon and it's actually built from the remains of St. John's Hospice. St. John's was a, a knightly order that kept a, a house for travellers and for sick people. Hospice is not a hospice in the sense we have it today. It was somewhere where travellers could go and if they were ill or if they were tired, they could um, stay there for a bit. Owen Dindu is supposed to have had a hideout in Snowdon. Um, I spent a great deal of time walking over Snowdon. And the one thing that struck me is there are so many vantage points in Snowdon. I think it'd be pretty hard for Owen Glyndwr to have a hideout up there. I wouldn't put it past him to go and turn up there for the odd conference or whatever, but I don't think he had a permanent hideout there at all. Um, I've actually got him arranging meetings there. This is Grossmont Castle. Grossmont was one of the biggest towns in Wales in medieval times. Again, it was burnt by Owen Glyndwr and uh, it never really recovered. And this is Lantony Abbey in Brecon and Carrickenin and Clan Castle. All of them have connections with Owen Glyndwr. He actually, one of the Scudamores was constable of the castle and he laid siege to it. And later on that Scudamore married his daughter Alice, just like when Henry IV wouldn't uh, ransom Edmund Mortimer after Owen Glyndwr captured him. Uh, Owen Glyndwr decided that Mortimer would be too useful where he was and he actually married his daughter Catherine to him. Snowdon is just full of uh, small cottages that are in desperate need of doing up or in a state of disrepair and it's almost impossible to try and date some of these. Uh, whether they, this actually is a medieval well in uh, Snowdon, and I'll be coming to the one that's in Penrith shortly. Move on to the next one. The parliament wasn't built uh, when Owen Glyndwr held his parliament here, but being Welsh, we never let the truth get in the way of a good story. And that's the parliament. 
I actually went in there and it's worth a look around and they've got quite a few uh, Old England door artifacts there. But it's typical Wales. We went in and I ordered a, a, the cafe next door and I ordered a coffee and a cake and we were sitting talking to people and the museum was closed and I said, you know, when will it be open? They said, oh, do you want to go? Here's the keys, you know, go and have a wander. And nobody came with us. It was just incredible. Welsh hospitality. In 1405, Owen Glendower actually took two castles and I had great problem trying to work out how he managed to do this until I found a document that cited that he paid someone a bribe. Uh, that's more likely than him having gunpowder or anything else which I also tied with. This gatehouse he turned into his own personal quarters. This gatehouse to the left of the door, um, to the right of the door, sorry not the left, uh, is called Mortimer's Tower to this day. It's where Edmund Mortimer and Owen Glendower's um, daughter lived and had four children. Uh, he turned it into his headquarters. He actually held a parliament here uh, right up until 1409. And then in 1409, Henry V came and took it back. And that was the end of uh, his fixed space. After that point, Owen Glendower um, was sort of homeless. And if you go back to the, yeah, if you look at this, there's um, a way into the sea and the sea actually lapped up as far as the walls. And this meant that his castle could be supplied from the sea. You go to the next one. When Harley Castle fell, Owen Glendower's wife, Margaret, his daughter, Catherine, two of her daughters, not one daughter and one son, she had four children by that stage, were taken prisoner by Henry V and they were put in the Tower of London. And I've read a lot of accounts that say that she was starved and badly treated and there's no doubt that his eldest son had been captured in battle and uh, was badly treated when he was in Nottingham Castle. When he was moved to the Tower of London, they were given quite good um, accommodation. And a man called John Wheel, who was working for Edmund Mortimer's nephew, was actually given the £30 a year to see to all their expenses. And on £30 a year, two women, two children and one man could probably live reasonably comfortable. If you go on to the next one, this is the sort of accommodation that people who were incarcerated in the tower could expect to find. You would, Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard, uh, who came much later, obviously, they wouldn't have been locked in cells and neither would um, Margaret Glendower or Catherine Mortimer. Right, this is where I'm going to deviate from a lot of the manuscripts and a lot of the research I've done. Where did Owen Glendower end up? A lot of people think he ended up on the borders. When I was going around Wales, I talked to a lot of people who um, really admired Owen Glendower, who'd read a lot about him, and they all said the same thing. There's no way that he would have died on the English-Welsh borders. He would have died in the heart of Wales. This is actually a picture of the Rhondda Valley, um, which is being replanted and hopefully may once again look a little like the great oak forest that covered most of Wales. Go on to the next one. And this is a map of medieval platform houses that were never properly excavated in the Rhondda Valley, uh, simply because in the 19th century, everybody wanted to sink pits and proper archeological digs would have taken time that people didn't have. But there's an awful lot of medieval buildings here. And these platform houses were almost like Welsh longhouses, 
with um, people one end, animals the other. And there's an awful lot of them around here, if you have a look, almost like a settlement. Go on to the next one. And this is a picture of the Rhonda at the height of the coal mining. And you can understand how any archaeological evidence from medieval Wales would have been buried at that point, I think. And go on to the next one. But somebody took photographs of these in the 1930s, and there's no doubt at all that they were medieval timbers reused in some of the farmhouses. This is not um, a timber that would have been used in a farmhouse. This comes from a much grander place. And there's another one in the slide following. And you can see that it would have taken time and money to actually make these timbers. And I really think, and these were actually found in the Rhonda as well, gold jewelry. And I really think that if Owen Glyndor was going to go anywhere, um, I think he would have tried to hide out in the forest. The De Clares and the Mortimers, both part owned the Rhonda, which was called at the time Glyn Rhonda. And it was known as a lawless forest. It was almost uh, had the reputation of Sherwood Forest. And if you're going to hide out, I think that would be a jolly good place to to do it. And when Owen Glyndua fought his first battles, when he attacked Ruthing Castle, uh, when the battle season was over and winter struck, he said to his men, go and hide among the population. And I'm pretty sure that's what he did at the end of his life. Uh, nobody ever betrayed him. We don't know where he's buried. But I'm guessing possibly the Rhonda. Go on to the next one. And where better than St. Mary's Well? Uh, there's a lovely story that a nun uh, dreamt that the Virgin Mary told her about this well and it became part of the pilgrim route into Wales. It wouldn't surprise me if um, Owen Glyndor was somehow buried there and people started to go there to pay homage to him and then in time things change. It's no more than a, an idea at the moment, but I am looking through a lot of manuscripts to see if I can find a connection. You go on to the next one. Uh, Delmy Thompson uh, took this photograph and I've got his permission to use it and uh, to me it just summarizes it that uh, yeah if you're going to get buried somewhere where where would be a better place or a more Welsh place than that and the next one uh, heaven forbid that these books that I've written ever be used by the Welsh nationalists to try and I don't know, recreate an independent Wales. Um, I don't think we're big enough to stand alone, but who knows? Provided it's uh, sorted democratically, who am I to argue? Owen Glyndua has gone. This is Henry VII. A lot of people say that dreams of Welsh independence went that day. We put a Tudor king of the throne. So did we win? Did we lose? I don't know. Um, the Tudors were one of the greatest dynasties and they were undoubtedly Welsh. Descended from one of Owen Glyndor's captains who was actually hung, drawn and quartered in 1412. Uh, Rhys Tudor, who was Henry VII's great, great grandfather. And the next one, and um, this is Julian Lewis Jones, very long suffering, who uh, volunteered to have his photograph taken for the jackets of the book. And the next one, just some bits that I found out that HMS Owen Glyndur served on the west coast of Africa, capturing slave ships and fighting to end the trade in human lives. Um, most people know that Owen Glyndor came seventh in a poll to name the top ten influential people of the millennium. I didn't realise myself that Owen Glyndor wasn't pardoned by the English Parliament until 1948.
And these are some of the stills we took when we were filming for the jacket. And that's Julian Lewis Jones. That's somebody we got playing the executioner. Uh, the director with the soldiers. And these are the finished jackets um, that have been worked on by the guy who designed my jacket called Steve Jones. And I have written three of them. And I'm working on the fourth, which hopefully should be out by the autumn. And then I will be going on to a new project. So if anybody's got any questions, I'd be delighted to answer them. <laughs>